Yeah, yeah. but uh, so they are kind of two two things happening at the same time. Yeah, but uh, I thought the, it would work so that it would like uh, clean the alarms. And yeah, after the alarm fires, the, 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 the when the emulator is closed, you have to kind of wipe the emulator screens. It doesn't lose the data, but if you want it to lose the data, you have to wipe the emulator. Yeah, because it has its own you know, data and it saves everything in the system. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's get started. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so we today will be talking about context aware mobile services and what they are, and in general, context awareness. Um, and this is an area of uh, mobile computing that has been getting a lot of attention. Um, so, right now, we are here, we have one more week to go, um, basically. Um, and um, this is where we start uh, kind of wrapping up uh, libraries and things that you can do with your smartphone uh, so that then when you start your project, at least you have a, a good skill set that you can use to create um, your project. Um, so context, um, what is it? Anyone? No cheating, don't, don't go to the slides to see what it is. What do you think context is? Surroundings. Surroundings. That's one way to see it, yes. No ideas, okay. Um, so there's no right answer, so it depends on who you ask, okay? Um, but if you think about uh, an uh, anthropologist, he will say that it's about everything that goes around an event or a statement or idea uh, in terms that it can be fully understood. Uh, if you ask a, like a, an author, it's basically what has been said before um, or after a specific passage, for example, in a book. And if you ask an engineer, uh, it's basically data. So a minimum set of data, uh, that can be used by task. Um, um, uh, basically, it allows you to resume the task if it gets interrupted. Um, but for us, um, and if we are in the vigorous computing field, uh, so it's basically any information that can be used to describe or characterize the situation of an entity. And by an entity, it can be a person, it can be a place, uh, or it can be an object. Um, and this is more related to the interaction that the user has with a system, okay? And, um, and this also includes the user or the application itself. Uh, so this, this definition comes from a paper that was published in 2001, uh, Understanding and Using Context. Uh, it's a very interesting paper, so if you, are curious to see how this definition came to be, it's there. But if we summarize it, basically we, we use any source of information or data, basically, or sensor, um, that can answer these five uh, whys. Uh, so what, when, who, where, and why, okay? So if you think about these questions, you can start thinking about, okay, if you create something, you might want to know what is it that the user is trying to do. When is it that the user is trying to do this? Who is it? So identifying who the user is can make a huge difference. Where the user is might also play a role. And why is the user trying to do what it's trying to do? Um, the why is hard because a lot of the, the why sometimes you can't measure. You need to kind of predict what the user is trying to do based on what he has been doing before. And so the why, there's a certain level of uncertainty in there, unless you actually explicitly ask the user. Um, so if we think about making a context-aware 
computing system. Um, it's a system basically that uses context, as we defined before, to provide relevant information. And this is important because it means that the system will work in the most appropriate way, ideally, uh, to the user when it's actually relevant, okay? Uh, which can also mean that part of the time a complex OS system is actually not doing anything because it doesn't have a purpose. Um, so in general, you can summarize in terms of features. A complex OS system, uh, they will have to have a sort of presentation to the user, which can take various shapes. It can be visual. We talked about this. It can be visual. It can be auditory. So there has to be a way where the system presents itself to the user. Okay? In general, a complex aware system will do stuff automatically. So when we build a complex aware system, it, there are going to be instances where the system is actually making decisions for you automatically. So it will try to make sense of what you're doing based on the sensor data that it's taking. Um, the tagging of context is uh, an interesting one. So this also allows control. So the thing about creating something that is autonomous also means that the user at some point will want to have some control over the system. So that means that when we basically tag context, that means that we are giving the system a hint of where uh, his presentation is relevant to the user. So this allows you to pinpoint a snapshot, let's put it this way, of all the sensors and all the machine learning, if you use machine learning, uh, to let it know that this is the right thing you did. So it's almost like uh, you are teaching the system that it's actually doing uh, something right or something wrong. So this, uh, this is where tagging actually comes helpful because you can train it over time to do better, okay? Um, so for how long do you think context has been in the minds of you know, researchers and academics and industry? How long? Let's say that the first computer was introduced in 1980, around that time. That's when people could afford to have a computer home. Um, you think context has been in the industry mind before that, or only after? Yeah, before. Before. Okay, that's correct. It's actually been in, uh, since 1969, even before computers were actually created. Um, what you have here is uh, DARPA's vision of how internet could be used in homes. And this is before the internet was actually available to everyone, even before everyone had a computer, okay? So what you're gonna see here is actually a vision created so that they could kind of prototype and brainstorm how could the internet transform people's lives, okay? So let's see the video so you can see what I'm talking about in here. Interesting. The audio is not coming there. Anyway, I can talk over it. So <clears throat> when they did this, there was no concept of um, keyboard, mouse. Uh, the concept that they had was a typewriter um, and radios. And so a lot of the interaction you see here actually requires knobs and pushing buttons, which is what they could think of in the beginning. And what you can see here is actually, this is not really a screen per se. What this is is just like a, a piece of paper that goes like that, or a camera feed, um, what they had. And this is also when they start thinking about the printer, like getting stuff printed out uh, from the computer. Um, and so what he's, they're talking about this, like all the documents are, uh, stored in a centralized location that your computer can talk with and retrieve. Um, and so these are things that, for example, pen input, that didn't exist then, 
but they were thinking about, okay, maybe in the future we'll be able to do writing on the computer itself. Um, what you have here is the old style of connecting someone to someone else using the plugs, like the phone lines in the old days, where they had to switch, okay, connecting to this person, they had actually someone disconnecting a cable, going there, connecting to another person. Um, and so they, they thought that that would be it. Like, uh, how do you connect me to someone else through the internet uh, was with a cable like that. Um, and you can see that this is, you know, checking online stores and things like this. Um, but uh, I guess what the idea here was, was how the computer could be used to connect two people who basically could be physically not in the same place. Uh, and they could inform each other what they were trying to do, what were they trying to achieve, ordering something, buying something, paying bills, and everything being in sync between them. Anyway. <clears throat> um, you can see the whole video um, on YouTube. It's almost done anyway here. I don't understand this. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So, context is hard. It's really hard um, it, because it's actually part of pretty much all the fields in computer science. So, if you think about machine vision, it tries to understand what the machine is seeing and it tries to see what's the relationship between the object, for example. Artificial intelligence, the same thing. Making sense of the data is hard um, in other fields. And so, <clears throat> in a way, um, sometimes when you see, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood, uh, they simplify context a lot uh, and they kind of prettify it, but it's really ch challenging to do uh, or materialize what Hollywood portrays as something that is possible to do today. Uh, so here's an example. Um, if you have seen Iron Man, um, this is him uh, using his computer. Um, and I will discuss a little bit after the video so you can see. So in here, you can see his computer is able to recognize gestures. He's able to position physically where something is. He's able to understand what this means to him. It's able to uh, position the item so that he's able to see it at any time. And he's able to understand where he's pointing at in 3D space is able to, you know, uh, make sense of what he's trying to do, select items, um, get rid of stuff that doesn't matter. He's able to understand what he's saying. It's asking it to get rid of stuff that's from the name. Making some decisions for him. So there's a problem here, for example, there are things happening behind him, he can't see it, but yet the computer is showing him stuff behind him. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> this is a very fantasy looking uh, kind of definition of what context is. Um, I'm not saying this is impossible. It is po probably possible to do something like this, especially if you have a augmented reality glasses and things like this. But we're not there yet. Um, a computer does not understand properly uh, context yet. It's, it's tough. 
Um, let me try to see if I can fix this audio because um, I have a few videos that would be good to get those. Okay, so let's see if this works. No. This is really strange. Okay, it's not working, but anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> in 2010, uh, we started seeing researchers uh, trying to create context aware systems. Why 2010? Any ideas? So when we had this um, his, history down the line uh, on mobile, mobile phones, so 2010 is when we started getting our hands in more sensor-rich devices. So the iPhone was introduced in 2010, okay? Uh, of course, there were other phones out there uh, but a lot of them didn't really have that many sensors built in. Uh, so for example, in this particular example here, he's using a phone that actually had an external GPS attached to it. It was not even part of the phone. And so what they did here was a location-aware mobile recommendation system. Um, and so this uh, system had uh, recommendations um, so it would try to infer what you're tr trying to do based on time and location so user activity was like are you going for lunch uh, are you looking for transportation are you going to take the bus and things like this it also had uh, in the vicinity uh, like uh, if it was closer to lunchtime you would actually uh, suggest uh, like places to go eat uh, based on the kind of food you eat and things like this. Um, and you could browse, as you can see, the touch screen was very different from what we are used to nowadays. Um, and uh, it had internet connection. Uh, the user could override the inference. So the, the machines were making mistakes. And so having some control to the user can make a huge difference, especially when you create a context aware system. Um, and so, you know, computers will be wrong sometimes, uh, and it's okay to teach it how to do better. And this is where the tagging that I mentioned before came, comes to play, okay? Um, here's another example. So some of these are commercial products. So Qualcomm is quite big in terms of mobile computing. They pretty much make all the uh, CPUs you have running on your smartphone. So this device that you saw there, that they put in space, like a small pad, that's really a beacon. Um, they, they have been exploited, let's put it this way, to do location-aware services. 
And this is where the business of Gimbal, for example, has been. It's about providing the user with information based on where they are, okay? And so this is one of the things that you will see is that <clears throat> a lot of these context-aware systems, location is premium information. And this is one of the reasons why uh, knowing where someone is can actually make a difference, like it's a very big difference. And when we're thinking about service design, so for example, if you're in a store, a grocery store, for you to know, for example, where the you know, sales are, for example, um, the store could use your location within the store so that it could guide you, okay, you're looking for, let's say, pasta, we actually have pasta on sale right here, for example, uh, or other things. Um, give me a sec, I'm gonna try to see if I can put this on the HDMI, to see if this works better. Especially for those online. Okay. Let me see. Places, things, and brands around them. It's an entirely new way to do it. Let me try this now. Uh, my computer's going nuts in here. Uh, okay. I don't know what the hell is happening in here. Computer failure, not context aware. Um, okay, so now we don't have anything in there either. What the hell is happening in here? Just a sec. Now you're seeing that there. Okay. Um, all right, so like I was saying, um, location comes with the premium. And so when uh, Intel uh, did a user survey, they were trying to see um, what is it that people would love their devices or phones or computers to be able to uh, provide to them as uh, context. What is it that they need? Mm, what was the name of that context paper you? It's uh, using and uh, understanding context. Oh, yes. understanding and using context, by the way. And yes. then So, what do you think? What do people want? What was common across them? 
if you were able to hear what they were saying. Um, Friday, mobile phone based on uh, their Yes. Uh, yes. So it's uh, the for the users, they see context as the device learning to get to know them. It's more about personalization. And it's all about uh, knowing what my favorite restaurants are, or knowing who my favorite friends are, and understanding how they're feeling throughout the day. Um, what else? So it seems to me that uh, the way how people perceive context is when the device is actually providing them with something that they feel like it's cared or catered basically or tailored for them, okay? Um, and so <clears throat> the other thing that is common here is that pretty much all of them mention my favorite place, my favorite restaurant. Mm -hmm. So it was all about location. So no wonder most of the platforms and everything that industry has done has pretty much been about tailoring user preference, getting to know where they are and the time of day and using that as a proxy to better understand what is it that the user wants to do. So answering the why that I mentioned before, okay? And so <clears throat> there's another company called uh, Movia that basically took all of this into a uh, context aware uh, solution, let's put it this way. So it's like an API. Um, that allows you to use multiple streams of data to try to make sense of what is it that the user is trying to achieve. Um, so Movia, this is a small ad for them. Movia explains how data fusion enables apps to anticipate users' needs. That's Lee on his way to meet his girlfriend, Suzanne. He uses an app to find out when his train is coming. Nowadays, there's an app for everything. But this can be quite long-winded. Lee needs to search for the right app, start it, and go through for info. And in theory, you need to keep checking for updates. What if the apps can give answers before Lee has to ask? Sounds futuristic? Well, Movia provides everything needed to work that magic. Movia is a pioneer in making sensor data available for app developers. Now Lee thinks he's running late to catch the train. But thanks to Movia Technologies, his smart app recognizes him running in the direction of the train station. It informs him that the train is late anyway, so there's no need to hurry. The moment his girlfriend Suzanne arrives, her phone sends an SMS to Lee. At the parking lot, it even remembers where she parked a week ago. It tells her about traffic jams on the way without the slightest hand movement while driving. How does it work? Movia provides a data fusion engine. This engine processes data from all possible sources with high performance and it can run all the time because it has an ultra low power usage. The development toolbox enables app creators to use all this fused data. With the cloud-based model library, Movia offers ready-to-use models for developers like movement patterns and much more for all areas of life. And it works on any operating system with any architecture and any sensor. All of this empowers future apps to anticipate problems on Suzanne's and Lee's way and helps bring them happily back together. Smart apps for smart people. Does this sound familiar? Oh. Sorry? The same Google is saying this. So. You said Google. They bought me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know. So, it's yeah. So, Google actually, so Movia became Evincent, which then got bought by TDK. Um, and then Google has actually uh, kind of subcontracted them, I guess. Um, 
And so basically they are in pretty much all the phones. So this engine is actually running on every single Android phone and also a lot of iPhones. Um, and so this uh, engine, let's put it this way, this data fusion engine is basically an API where uh, a lot of algorithms exist in there to try to make sense of the sensor data. And we get to enjoy them because they make applications using them. So for example, Google Maps and all these things like knowing if there's a delay in traffic and things like that, it comes through the, all the sensing that is going on in here. Um, so here's a code snippet. So in your application, if you want to see what device, what sensors exist in your device, now all you need is these uh, lines of code. So you will need uh, get an instance of the sensor manager. So that's the service on the operating system that manages all the sensors you have. And then from there, you can get the sensor list where you can specify the kind of sensor you're interested in. There's one that is type all, so you get a list of all of them. So you can see what is available on your phone. And then for each one of them, you can actually see what they have or use the data. Um, <clears throat> so there's a few rules of thumb, let's put it this way, for when you're creating, a, trying to create a context-aware application. So first of all, uh, it's user ex expectations. So the thing is about, and this is hard. And so if you're trying to do something uh, automatically and you do it wrong, or you infer that the user is trying to do something else, uh, that's gonna frustrate people. So for example, let's say you made something that is designed to play music automatically when the user puts the headphones. It might be that the user wants to hear the music, but it might also be that he's gonna make a phone call. So you cannot make a proper judgment just based on the fact that he's plugging in the headphones, right? Um, the other thing about is be conservative of notifications. So a strategy that many applications use today to keep the user informed and stuff uh, is to use notifications. And then you, you end up getting like 200 or something notifications in a day. If you have Android um, and you use this uh, digital well-being app that Google has recently introduced, you can actually see how many notifications you get in a day and the numbers go to 300 easily in a day. Um, so in a way, um, the rule of thumb here is only use notifications if it's really important. Uh, otherwise, uh, assume that everything's okay and you don't need to bug the user every single time something changed, for example. And the other thing is battery life. Uh, so the thing about using sensors and making sense of them is that you're gonna drain people's phones battery. And so this also means that whenever you are using a sensor, you need to remember to turn it off when your app is not running. Because by default, actually, Android just keeps it running all the time. So if you connect to, let's say, the accelerometer, uh, and you get an instance of that, if you don't turn it off, it will just continue using that the whole day. And it's just going to kill the, someone's phone like really fast. Um, so I actually prepared a demo for today, uh, and the source code is right here. So you can actually download it if you want and uh, play with it. Uh, let me show you uh, what I did in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what I, I built. <clears throat> okay, so that's my phone right there. Um, I'm just going to open it in here. And so what you have in here is the list of all the sensors I have on my phone. And one thing that you'll see is actually there's more than one sensor for the same kind of data. So for example, temperature, temperature, temperature. Two different manufacturers. They're actually different sensors. Same manufacturer. The other thing, for example, edge detection sensor. So it actually can detect that I'm holding my phone on the edges. Uh, accelerometer, magnetometer, ambient light, proximity. Here's gyro. So that one is calibrated. This one is uncalibrated. Uh, accelerometer, uncalibrated. Uh, what else? That's cameras, color sensor, real light. 
So it actually detects light from the back of the phone. Uh, what else? Device pickup, so it can actually detect when I'm lifting my phone, so it has a sensor for that. Um, what else? Uh, front camera light, game rotation, geomagnetic rotation vector, step counter, step detector, tilt sensor, device orientation. And you can see some of them are actually made by Google. And so that means that they are not actually sensors per se, like hardware sensors, but they are software based. So that means that they make sense of some other sensor, hardware sensor, in order to generate a new kind of sensor that is just an abstraction, so the data fusion that I was mentioning. So I actually put a button in here so you can see this, uh, how you could use a sensor real time. So I actually am connecting to, in the example I have coded is I'm using the light sensor. So you can see how you can actually use the sensor in real time. Uh, so if I press the awareness, so this is telling me that right now in here, we have about 460, but it's actually, it reacts in real time. So if I cover it, you can see it goes lower, okay? So I can use this to know whether or not it's bright in here or not. Um, so right now I have on destroy, so when I leave the app, it will turn off the sensor. Otherwise it will be on forever, and then it's gonna kill my battery, okay? So in the example I have um, for you guys, um, uh, let me show you how that works. I already opened Android Studio here. Um, so <clears throat> here's the example I mentioned before. So I have here the sensor manager, and then I have here the light sensor. So in here, I specify the sensor type light. And then in there, I declared uh, a sensor event listener. So what happens when that sensor data changes? Um, and in here, all I'm doing is uh, I'm changing the text to show the current value of the light. Um, and um, here you have on destroy, I have here to unregister the listener. So this is really important. If you forget to do that, your phone's gonna die and you don't know why, okay? So some apps unfortunately didn't do this, like, uh, buggy apps, so games and stuff like this, and they turn on the accelerometer and all this stuff, and then you play the game and then you leave the game and then that thing is still running uh, in the back end. Um, so if you, if you go to your phone to the battery usage, you will see which apps are consuming a lot of battery, and I can tell you like 80% of them will be because of this, that they forgot or they are not unregistering the listener for the sensor data. Um, Okay, um, so like I said, this is shared, uh, so you can take a look at this. Um, this is quite simple. Uh, if you want to see how to use other sensors, uh, like I said, the developer website uh, from Android is quite good at this. Um, the last time I was trying to show this, my screen resolution was so small that the things were just lower, but actually, um, let me show you. So if we go to Sensor Manager, So Google actually, in here on the top right, you can actually choose which language to see the example. So if we could choose Kotlin, uh, it updates the, the information. Although here, it's still Java in here. Um, but let me show you, they do have a tutorial somewhere here. Um, so sensor. So let's see the proximity sensor, for example. It will tell you. <clears throat> okay. So for example, if you want to make sense of what are the sensors like, uh, so this is uh, the properties of that uh, sensor event. So you have the values in there. And then depending on the kind of sensor, you have different values. So app accelerometer will have uh, 0, 1, and 2, and that's x, y, and z. Um, here's an example of what you can do with the sensor. Um, 
So linear acceleration, type magnetometer, uh, gyroscope. Uh, so they have here examples of what you can do with the data, okay? Um, if this sample, or in this case, these are in Java, if you copy paste this into your project, and that has been asked to be done in Kotlin, it will automatically convert this. Um, um, they have a lot of stuff here done where they actually show this in Kotlin. So let me go here. So let's go here to the motion sensors. Uh, so this just shows you a list of all the motion sensors and what they collect. Um, and here you have, now this is working. So you have Kotlin, how do you get the, for example, using the gravity sensor? Here's an example in there. Uh, how do you get that? So type gravity, linear acceleration, um, rotation vector, how does that work? Like what is the reference uh, of the values? Uh, significant motion, so to detect if the user is moving or not moving, things like this, okay? So, like I was saying, the developer.android.com, uh, if you learn how to read this, you can pretty much find like solutions for pretty much everything. Um, a lot of times when you search for something on Google, it will actually point first here and then maybe Stack Overflow if someone has asked the same kind of question. Um, but of course, it depends a lot on what you're trying to do. Um, all right. So feel free to uh, download the project, change it if you want to, and see how you can use other sensors and things like this. So, so the guys at Google, um, like I was saying, Movia is actually nowadays wrapped up into what is called the Google Awareness API. And uh, it combines a subset of all the sensors you could think of um, by answering very uh, peculiar questions. So for example, you can ask you can ask things the time of day, location, place, um, activity. Are you walking, running, uh, biking? Um, proximity to beacons. So what are the beacons around you? Uh, the state of the headphones is it plugged in or unplugged? And even the weather. So it actually can give you what is the current weather. Um, and so it works by taking snapshots of context. So what it does is to save power, it just records a little bit of the sensors all at the same time and then makes sense of that and you get yes, no, things like this. So you don't have to do that yourself. Um, and then um, it also has a very nice API for creating geofences. And so that means that you could actually use something like this for, for example, the homework or even your projects where you can define uh, geofences, where things are triggered when the user comes in and comes out, okay? Uh, the link for the API is right here. Um, and uh, I have a question there. So what's the difference between location and a place? So I was talking about tagging context. So a place is literally a Unknown. Sorry? Unknown. The place is unknown, but the location is sort of uh, no. like place. No, so location is more like GPS, like you get the coordinates. Mm. You know where it is in the world, but you don't know what it is. And so a place is basically a packed location where you could give it a higher level meaning of what that location is. So for example, my house or my work. Okay, um, and so this this actually this has to do with these fences API. So when you define a, a fence, let's put it this way, you're basically teaching your your phone or your app what that location means. Okay, and then you can actually create rules based on that location. So for example, every time I get home, turn on the lights, uh, turn on the radio, things like this. Okay, or every time I get to work, mute my phone. You know, you can create rules like this. Um, so if we think about an app or the architecture, when you create an app that is context aware, we have the sensors, you get the raw data, you do some pre-processing, uh, 
Sometimes you might have to store it or manage it so that you remember things and then you make an application. So this looks familiar, right? Um, so if we think about this, this actually looks like how the, the phone works. So if you have something your phone has, the operating system will do some raw data and it will use this data um, to enhance basically how your phone works. So if you rotate your screen, your screen rotates with it. So if you use YouTube and you rotate it, it changes. If you take a picture sideways, it, it does that. Um, and so in a way, your phone is a context management kind of system, right? Um, so <clears throat> I already showed this before. So the, <clears throat> the way you use these, you can actually make very compelling applications. So during my research, we have used this uh, tool that literally simplifies the data access with the sensor. So it's like a library for getting access. To, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> Just a sec. <coughs> Kennedy was supposed to give this lecture today, but um, <coughs> he was afraid. <coughs> <coughs> so um, if you go here, we kind of made um, a library for getting sensor data. <coughs> And uh, if you're making an app, you can also use it. Uh, so if you don't want to use Google Awareness API, if you rather trust me, <laughs> you could use our library, okay? We have uh, different libraries uh, for different things. So for example, we can even connect to Fitbit, so you can get data from the Fitbit, like the heart rate, steps, and things like this. Um, this is a wrapper around the Google Pin recognition, um, and this is uh, a wrapper for uh, open. So you can get the temperature and the per like what are the, um, how's the weather going to be like for the next week and things like this. Um, so <clears throat> if we think about requirements uh, for context aware applications, um, they pretty much go through these. So how do you get data? So that's the acquisition part. So how do you, where do you get the data from? Um, how do you aggregate the data? So sometimes you, you need to use historical data for you to be able to make a better decision. So you cannot just use what is the current value, but you might have to look at the last five minutes so that you understand like what is the user doing, especially if you're doing things like activity recognition. Um, so consistency, so same input, same output. So this is hard because sometimes what can happen is that if you're using machine learning, the machine learning might give you a different output in, like if you gave it the same input, um, if you made a different rationale. Uh, although that is very rare, but um, it can happen that given the same conditions, um, that what the user is trying to do is very different. So for example, the headphones. The input is the same, so he plugged in the headphone into the phone. But what the user is trying to do is different, so the output is going to be different. Uh, discoverability, so discovery. So the, the, I guess that one of the challenges uh, when you, we build a context aware system is that sometimes uh, things happen automatically in the background. So how do you make sure that the user knows what's going on um, and make him aware of the, the decision making that is happening. Um, so query, being able to ask the system, what are you thinking? Uh, why are you thinking this way? Um, so adaptation, so making the application learn with new data. As you get new data, can you learn? Um, understanding the data, so making sense of the data, that's another one. Quality indicator. So <clears throat> this is actually a very hard uh, research uh, area, which means you're not, you cannot rely 100% all the time on the sensor data. Sometimes the sensors, they get faulty, they stop working. So a very good example of this is, for example, the, this Boeing uh, 747 MAX uh, that basically the plane thought it was going down just because of a faulty sensor. And uh, the person, the pilot was trying to push it up all the time, 
that from the <clears throat> plane thought that it was going down, so it was always trying to go up, and the, the pilot was always trying to go down, and then basically that would stall the plane, and then the plane crashed. Um, so being able to make decisions based on the quality of the sensors, that's really difficult. And then integration. So when you do a context-aware system, it means that you, you might have to integrate with other things that exist on the user's surroundings. So for example, if you think about um, Google Assistant, uh, so now uh, all the manufacturers are trying to integrate with Google Assistant so that you can say, okay, turn on the light, uh, turn on the fan, uh, start making my coffee. And so these kind of things, so that means that in a way, uh, these devices need to fit in in an uh, existing ecosystem, right? Um, so that's about integration. Um, so if we think about uh, the many years of uh, things that have been done around this area, a lot of them have been mostly about systems. Um, and so, because it's difficult to create an application. So there are some applications of these, um, but we are not there yet because we don't have yet um, machine learning, artificial intelligence sophisticated enough to not make mistakes. And so that means when a lot of these, we need to solve first the systems problem. So how we make sense of the data, how do we get the right data uh, in order to make the best applications. And so it's like a chicken and egg problem. Um, and so a lot of the contributions have been on the system side. Um, I think it will become real at some point. Um, and uh, there are two different visions for this. So one of them is more utopian, where technology is used for good. And there's also dystopian, where the technology can be used for bad. Um, I do have a couple of videos here uh, showing these. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, a utopian vision of how context awareness could be used uh, in a good way. So think about this from the perspective of context awareness. So the computer in the house knows that she's in front of you know, doing certain things, but it was important for her to know that she had something scheduled for that day at that specific time. Um, so he's cooking, he's seeing the news, um, turning on the heat. The ability to recognize different kinds of users, so identity, changing what it can do based on the person. And spying. That's one way to see it, yes. <laughs> So this is a very utopian kind of thing. But this is also what I was saying about integration. Being able to use different devices where they can talk to each other and share a different uh, set of functionalities that complement each other. Um, We're so far from this, um, and like I said, this is a vision kind of thing. 
Um, here you can see personalization. So basically, because the city knows who she is and where she's going with the car, you could actually change the sign to give her instructions to where to go that is specific for her. Of course, this won't work in practice because you have more than one person driving in the road, but it could be something that could be shown, for example, on your car. And that's how navigation works, pretty much. Anyway, so you got the idea. Um, so this is another, this is the opposite. So where technology could actually be used for spying, like you said. Um, Has anyone seen this before? Not you guys, I know you have. Okay. Some of these things are quite neat, so you can actually see whether something is going bad or um, gamify mundane things like doing your groceries or uh, cooking. So you can make your, I guess, your daily life a bit, you know, more fun. You also get ads in your eyes. You can't say no. Remember when I was talking about information overload? So this is where, you know, something like this could happen, where you get bombarded with information from all your senses, your ears, your eyes, um, and everything. You can see it's He's experienced all of it, all of this, but completely empty room. So what he was doing in the social reverse engineering, so trying to get more information about her taste and her personality based on what she shares publicly on social media. Not really. Sign, I'm about to hit level five, I'm not going to 
I hate the face, but nice place. So that's a very um, pessimistic way of using technology to put this way. Um, so there's a metaphor in here that maybe you didn't realize, um, which is for the over information overflow uh, that I was mentioning. And there's also the validity of the information you get uh, nowadays. So if you think about deep fakes, have you seen these videos where they make, you know, Obama say something or Donald Trump say something where you can actually even tell the difference. Um, and so this is where technology has been used for the wrong things, uh, where you actually are led to believe something has happened where it has not happened, like fake news and things like this. Um, if you browse uh, Twitter nowadays, and if you search for coronavirus, you're going to see a lot of videos uh, of things happening in there that actually didn't happen at all. Um, these are put out of context. People make videos by mixing things up. Uh, there was even something about, uh, you know, when they had this uh, H1N5 uh, virus, the swine flu, uh, and that was affecting the, you know, the pigs. And they, <clears throat> they actually are saying that the Chinese right now are basically mass murdering a lot of pigs just to contain the coronavirus. It has nothing to do with that or anything, and they just portrayed it as being drastic measures. And there was even a video of the police with a, a gun, and you could hear gunshots and stuff like this where nothing like that happened. And so it's, it's, it's really uh, difficult for us to distinguish what is real, what is not real. Um, and so just keep a critical eye and you know, take things with a grain of salt whenever you see these things online. But let's talk about positive things, okay? So this is where I believe uh, technology uh, should be used uh, from a context-aware system perspective for good stuff. Um, so this is, have you seen Neuralink? 
Okay, so Neuralink is uh, an add-on for someone's brain. And so this allows um, input from your brain to technology. So it's a brain-computer interface. This is being created by Tesla right now, uh, a new company. They uh, and they're trying to allow you to interface with technology in ways that has never been possible before. Um, so we're able to miniaturize a computer basically to such a small size, like the size of the grain of the rice. Um, and then you can use that same sensor to interface with you know, limbs or a car or anything. So that's one of them. Here's another one. This is a prosthetic leg. So this professor lost both of his legs and he decided to build his own legs. And these legs actually can read his brain and he can keep his balance almost like a normal person. Uh, this is an interesting uh, documentary. So this, he's just saying how he lost his legs. He was lost in the cold. But then he created his own legs and then he started being able to do things that were not physically possible. Like humanly, humanly possible. He actually gave a TED talk where you can actually see him just walking around. You can see it here. Um, he actually was able to make his own legs with hooks that allowed him to grab things that would not be possible with your own hands or your feet. Um, and the funny thing about this is that then he started getting emails of people saying, I'm going to chop off my legs so you can give me one of those because uh, I really like it. <laughs> This is kind of scary if you think about this. But he's able to walk. Let me show you how he walks so you can see the difference. Pretty natural. He can be as tall as he wants to be. So this is that. Um, here's another one. This is bionic arm. So now this I am able to um, Read your brain to also induce sensation, so you can actually artificially feel that you're grabbing something. Also, these are cutting-edge kind of technology uses. If I can recording be more or less active, 
So here they're training the machine learning to read his brain, to go back to the arm, and then basically he can control the arm just by thinking. But uh, is it more like... Uh, uh, more like... Um, Harder if you have to always think what you do when you like uh, when you when you like lift your hand. Uh, normal person can just lift their hand, but he has to think that now I lift more my hand. Yeah, so that's like, the thing that they're trying to minimize. So you don't have to think anymore like that. So you would just yes. lift your, you. You would have the same input as what you would have as you lift your hand. So this is where they are now trying to do this. And this is what also Neuralink is trying to do. So that yes. you, won't, you won't have to think about moving anything external, but it's also, it's like an extension of you. So it's, it's you yes. that is moving. Yeah. But anyway, so this is where what we call in our kind of uh, research, the augmented human. Uh, movement. So the trying to see how we can go beyond the physical limitations, for example, or you know, uh, some accident happened. We need to come up with something that can bring back again some of the lost capabilities. Uh, there's also some work done, and uh, I actually read an article yesterday about how they are now able to um, make you see things with a fake eye. So someone who lost his vision, they can actually perceive something that is what we perceive as eyesight. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> things, uh, types of context or systems. So in the leg example in there, he was talking about having a more active as rather than a passive uh, leg. So if you think about prosthetics, normally they are passive. They're just there, they don't change shape, they, they're just static. But if you have a prosthetic that actually adapts and changes depending on what's going on around the environment, so being more context aware, are you going up the staircase, are you walking in a, like on a straight line, changes how the leg works, right? Uh, or if you're thinking about the arm, like are you trying to grab something, are you pinching, is it an egg, is it a cup? So the amount of strength you can do is different, right? Um, and so this is where this passive and active um, component of context aware systems comes into play. Um, so for example, a passive one is basically where the user needs to provide input for it to change. Uh, but if you think about active behavior, or active, it means that it changes automatically given the input that is constantly coming. And you as a user, you just experience that. Uh, so for example, I have here an example of the navigation. So let's say you made a wrong turn when you're driving. You don't need to tell it, oh, please give me another alternate route. It will just do that for you automatically because it knows what you're trying to do, okay? Um, so there are different ways where you can think about context and how to make sense of it. So you can think about low to high level. So you have, uh, for example, the GPS. So going from a GPS to a street or a place is more useful for you on the long run because you won't remember the coordinates, the GPS coordinates, but you can remember someone's address. So that's easier. Um, there's also this, what we call a compounded context inference. So if something is true, then something else is true. So for example, if I'm here in this room, it means that I'm at the university. It means that I am in Finland, you see? So you can go higher and higher level in things like this when you think about context. Um, so for example, I'm here, I have more social social uh, in my calendar, that means that I'm busy. So you can think about the calendar as an, a sensor in this way. And then we can also think about the opposite. So if all of this is true, that means that something else is false. So for example, I'm busy right now, I'm not available at the party right now. Or for example, I cannot take a phone call, okay? Um, and so this is 
where you can also think on the negative side of context generation or inference. So why is this context so important? And why is it so hard? So if we think about um, computers, um, so in the old days, um, we had what we call these room-sized computers where a bunch of people could have access to one computer because no one had a computer at home. Uh, we are now transitioning to more uh, this. So we have, before people could have maybe one computer at home, the phone was not really a computer, you could just make phone calls and text. But nowadays we have a bit more here. So we have your laptop, you have your desktop, you have your gamer TV, you have your car and everything. Um, but it might be that in the future, you actually have multiple people using the same device. And this is already happening. So if you think about Google Home or even a Chromebook, how many, if you haven't used a Chromebook, you'd be surprised that you can actually borrow a Chromebook from someone. You log in with your Google account and then you have all your stuff in there. You don't necessarily need to own the laptop anymore. So that's one of the benefits, for example, of having a Chromebook compared to a Windows machine or a Mac machine. So it's more of a shared kind of technology. Um, and so we think that in the future, it might be that you know, uh, the concept of ownership of a computer might change. So you might have what we call, let's say, a public device, like for example, on the corridor, where anyone can go there. And if it knows that it's you, you will cater all of it to you. So you have your files, you have all your things that you need to work right there. And this is already kind of happening with these virtual machines where basically everyone has an instance of what is the computer for you. Um, but this is also happening, for example, in Google Assistant. So Google Assistant is actually being tailored to you. So the more you use it, the more you will understand how you say things. Um, when I started using Google Assistant, sometimes it would have a hard time to know what I'm saying. And nowadays it's actually really, really good. Uh, even when I'm not, not saying something what the same way as a Native American would say or British, I speak a hybrid language to put it this way. Um, but yeah, so the thing is, technology, like we saw before, for it to be more engaging and more useful for the user, it needs to be personalized in many ways. Okay, and context is one of that way, in the sense that you make sense of the sensors so that you can build something that is useful for the user when he needs it, okay? And that's why it's important. And that's it. That's all I have for today. Any questions? Are you gonna do a context-aware application for the project? That's <coughs> rare because I don't have the project yet. Okay. Start thinking about it. Start thinking about uh, how you could make an app that could leverage context as a, a way of making sense of things. So for example, the, the dog sniffing, the cancer thing, it's a bit about context, where you have the, you, the, you need to understand what the dog is doing, where he's going, uh, why he made that path, uh, what is the rationale that the dog is going through. Of course, it's hard, it's gonna be hard, um, but that whole, purpose of the app is to label, which is kind of context tagging of what's going on with the dog and the sniffing and the cups and where the sample is and things like this. Um, in the previous years, there are some apps that have used context, so they're running, there were quite a few of these sports tracking or um, activity tracking and things like this, so then they were trying to automate uh, these things. Uh, so, for example, my phone right now, the Google Assistant actually detects when I'm driving. It actually mutes my phone automatically when I go into the car. Um, and it launches Android Auto on my car so I can see, like, okay. Um, and I even, like, uh, started doing this recently uh, with the latest update on Google Maps. It actually asks me, are you going to work? And I just say yes, and that's it. And it just starts navigation, for example. Um, but it also works with a calendar. So if I have an event in there, let's say take my kid to gymnastics and I have the address in there, 
when I when it's around that time that I'm driving, it also tells me, "Are you going here? Are you going there?" And so it's trying to make this. It doesn't do it automatically. Like I said, not every day, not every day. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, a complex array system should not be fully autonomous, and the user will always want to have some control over what's going on. And so this is where you need to be careful about the data quality. Like, what is it you're getting? Are you getting this right? Are you trying to do this for sure? And then do the activity, okay? All right, that's it for today, okay?